Right, so we'll make a start. Um, so, hello everyone, my name's Brett Lanyos. I'm the part of the uh, project coordination team for, uh, for EBCU. So welcome to this, uh, this workshop, it's our third workshop. Um, if you could mute your microphones, that would be much appreciated. One thing I would say is there is a chat window on the, in this facility at the bottom. So once Tim, I want to hand over to, over to Tim and he starts talking to the panel, if I could ask you to um, please put your questions in the chat window. And what I'm going to do is read out your questions to Tim when he prompts me to. So it's, it should be fairly straightforward. And I hope you have a, a very good, uh, enjoyable workshop. Um, the only other thing I would say is there is an evaluation which you'll have had when you got your event rights notification. So if you could please complete the evaluation uh, near the end of the workshop, that'd be much appreciated. And I will put a link to that, to the, um, the chat window as well. And I think that's it from me. So I'm gonna hand over to Bo, who will do the introduction as chairman of the European Beer Consumers Union. Over to you, uh, Bo. Yeah, uh, thank you, Brett. And I uh, not hope my uh, microphone is too windy. I'm in the absolutely most northern part of Denmark right now. Uh, but it's sunny and uh, I, I have beer, so I'm prepared for this uh, seminar. And yes, I'm a chairman of European Beer Consumers uh, Union, uh, an umbrella organization for uh, national consumer organizations uh, in the beer world in uh, 19 countries around Europe. We start up this uh, seminar uh, a few months ago to a little bit to to do a network uh, organization, uh, to run a network organization uh, in times like this is uh, a little, yeah, a little tricky. As uh, Simon Spillane said uh, a few months ago, I had a meeting with him, was that you got stuck in your network now. You can't do anything about your network. Uh, you can call them and you can't expand, you can't do anything. But we are a network organization of national uh, beer uh, consumer unions uh, worldwide Europe. Uh, beer consuming, yes, you are a lot of beer consumers, but actually into the consumer rights, uh, there's not so many organized um, organizations about that. I think in Denmark we have uh, one for chocolate too, but uh, beer is uh, the most, the biggest one, of course, and the one who actually involves uh, the most people. Also in the brewing industry, there's a lot of issues uh, around this. And uh, the breweries actually depend on the consumers and the other way around. So uh, we are working on, uh, as you can see on our website, we are working on three major points in, uh, in these things. One of them is, of course, uh, diversity in, in beers when you are a consumer. If you go to a beer shop as well, and you are, have to be sure about the, uh, the diversity of beers and also the on national level, especially, but also when you go abroad to, to other countries as well as beer drinkers. Also, uh, we are a little about uh, ingredients. Please tell the consumer what's in the beer and who brewed it and the information. That's good uh, consumer um, business as well from the brewer side. It's been better. And I also know that the food industry has uh, been better to, to actually tell about what's, we, uh, what's in it, what's in it nowadays. But the, the brewing industry has been that, had that uh, uh, mm -hmm. thinking for the many, many years ago. So uh, of course, please label the beer and tell us uh, all about it. And of course, the third thing is pricing. We don't say it, uh, we want cheap beer, but we want a fair price. Uh, pricing about beers is uh, an issue from the big breweries, also an issue for small breweries. And especially in these times when we can't go to a bar, we have to go to our local brewery uh, to buy beers and all that kind of thing. So also the pricing is uh, a big issue for the consumer. And then beer consuming umbrella organization as EBCU is uh, a lot of networking. Uh, we are talking together a uh, minimum twice a year on our delegate meeting and uh, just do best practice for consumers in, uh, on national level in different countries. 
of course, in Northern Europe, in the Nordic countries, and also in Ireland as well, is um, a bit about the taxation of beers is uh, huge. It's not the same problem they have in the Czech Republic and uh, Italy, something like that. But we have a lot of different issues as consumer and consumer organization, how you can organize your, your national uh, organization as well. So EBCU is what it's all about. And uh, we are behind these meetings, but uh, and uh, some of the people is also have the roots in the uh, European Beer Consumers Union. But uh, please go to our website, actually updated yesterday with some new key points and all that kind of things, and uh, read more about it. And I'll be here on the, at least on the sound side. So if anyone has some questions uh, during the meeting, uh, please uh, be welcome as well. Thank you, Bert. Any questions, anyone now, then uh, just go back to Brett. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Bert. Um, so yes, just to repeat for people who've arrived a little bit later, um, if you could mute your microphones, uh, I'm going down, so you should be muted. Uh, if you wish to ask a question, please sure. do so by the chat window, by clicking at the bottom, clicking on the chat window. And what I'm gonna do every so often, I'll prompt, um, uh, I'll, I'll let Tim know what the questions have, uh, that have come in. And the final thing for me is if you could complete an evaluation at the end, that would be much appreciated. And if you have any suggestions for a workshop, please do uh, uh, put them, uh, go onto the website, the UBC website on the events page and pop your suggestions in. And possibly you wish to uh, present a workshop. Thanks very much. I'm going to hand over to um, Tim now, um, who's going to run the workshop. And my thanks to, uh, to Tim and the rest of the panel from me. So over to you, Tim. Thanks, Brett. Um, good evening. Welcome to this seminar about the future of beer and brewing in Europe after COVID. Uh, I'm Tim Webb, and I'm going to be uh, hosting the discussion this evening. We're very fortunate to have uh, a panel of experts who are each very eminent in different fields within the world of beer. Uh, to discuss how we think the COVID pandemic and the various international reactions to the pandemic uh, is going to affect beer and brewing in the broadest sense as we've come to know it. Uh, I'll just repeat a few of the uh, housekeeping points. If you could all remain muted, that would be great. We've had some really lovely background noises coming in other um, uh, seminars, which have proved quite interesting. Um, if, uh, yeah. The, um, I can assure you that having you all muted is a very weird experience for the panelists, but we'll try to deal with it. Um, with regard to the questions that uh, you're welcome to put into the chat room, uh, I just remind you this is a seminar that's very much about beer and brewing. Uh, we're not really going to be discussing pubs very much, and for those of you in the UK, we're, I'm afraid this is one where cider is excluded. Uh, finally, if you might just note behind me, looks a little bit like a renovation project. This is because it is a renovation project. About uh, four weeks ago, I moved into, I, I moved my little apartment in Bristol uh, into a large farmhouse in Devon that's at the top of a hill and remarkably cold. Um, it involved taking stuff from three different storage areas and putting them into one house. And it appears that all of the rubbish has ended up in my office. I promise you it'll be sorted out as I promised my partner, it'll be sorted out sometime in the next six months, but not today. Um, anyway, I'm going to start by asking our panel to introduce themselves um, and to say something about what they think uh, about the bigger picture of the pandemic. I'm going to go first. Uh, I'm Tim Webb. I've been active in the beer consumer movement for over 40 years now. Uh, I also write books about beer. Uh, most prominently Good Beer Guide Belgium, uh, which I wrote for about 25 years until a couple of years ago. I've now done three editions of a book called The World Atlas of Beer. Uh, and that deals with how beer is doing uh, all around the globe, uh, which involves me and my co-author keeping touch with stringers in different countries, about 35 different countries around the world. And incidentally, we've had to update the latest edition which came out in October, we're updating it for the American imprint. Uh, and we've had, it, that's involved us contacting all our, co, uh, our um, national stringers to see how COVID has been impacting. 
The biggest fear I have about the pandemic is that governments will use the undoubted battering that the brewing and hospitality industries have taken in the last 15 months as an excuse to try to reduce sales of alcohol and will do relatively little to help struggling producers, retailers and others in the beer world to get back into business. Uh, in contrast, the most unexpected thing I've seen in the pandemic has been the speed with which many breweries, uh, smaller independent ones in particular, have been able rapidly to transform their whole business models to react to the imposed restrictions. For example, shifting from draft to container beers and from away from selling via wholesalers to uh, delivering direct to consumers. And that gives me hope that they will be able to survive after the pandemic. Uh, that's me. Uh, Simon, would you like to go next? Thank you, Tim. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Bo and uh, colleagues at EBCU for, uh, for inviting me to, uh, to join this evening's panel. Good evening. My name is Simon Spillane. I'm a, I'm a dual, dual national. I'm a British and Belgian um, living in Brussels and I'm working at the Brewers of Europe for the last 17 years. Um, and uh, just, I just had a quick look through the uh, through the participants, and it's good to see some names uh, down there of, of people who I've shared a beer with at the at the Brewers of Europe offices over the years. And uh, I hope that that time will be possible again in the not uh, not too distant future. Um, I was muted by the host just then. I think. Uh, <laughs> that, that's the problem, Brett. I think. When <laughs> anyway, but uh, for those of you who don't know, the the Brewers of Europe is the the voice of the European beer industry towards uh, European and global institutions. Our members are the national brewers associations from twenty nine European countries. Um, just in terms of the um, the impact that COVID has had, I mean, we recently actually published a report. Um, that showed how beer hospitality declined by 42% uh, and the overall beer market declined by 9% in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, and I think probably if you were to look at April uh, 2020 to April 2021, obviously these figures would have been even more, even more drastic as they would have covered the, the full, full period of uh, many of the closures. Um, I think probably my biggest fear is the number of uh, bars, pubs, and restaurants that simply won't reopen or for whom the recovery won't come fast enough. Um, we have contacts for the, the hospitality sector uh, association here, and they're, they're, they're very concerned that, about the time that the recovery will, will take and, uh, and the fact that uh, even places that will be reopening will be reopening in very difficult conditions and uh, not with the same balance sheet as they, as they, as they had when they, when, they, when they had to shut. Um, so I think that's my sort of biggest, biggest fear. And perhaps on an optimistic note, um, I would say that what the lockdowns have perhaps made people really understand is the importance of beer and hospitality to communities, society and the economy. Um, and uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that probably never before we had politicians talking so much about pubs and uh, pubs and beer. Um, we saw just uh, just the. Uh, Today, with uh, with with them reopening in France, all the politicians wanted to be seen in in in, in bars, pubs, and cafes. And uh, I think that is so. There is a, an increased recognition of the importance of our pubs and beer. Um, and I think um, that's a sort of the, the counterpoint to Tim's concern. I think my my hope is that these same people will see beer hospitality as a, a sector that can actually kickstart the economy, that can kickstart job creation, and actually kickstart society as a as a whole. So in the same way that the impact has been huge, the knock on effects. So they also see this as a, a part of the um, uh, a part of the society that can actually really um, uh, push the recovery. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Simon. Ina. I need to unmute. You need to unmute. Okay, um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the hosts, um, Brad and Tim. Um, I'm Ina, I come with a very funny and very Bavarian family name of Bastel. Um, usually 
pronounced as Würstel or sausage by foreigners, but I'm quite happy with that as long as people call me by my first name. I'm a business journalist. I write for Brauwelt. I have been covering the brewing industry for more than 20 years. So in terms of, of activism, no, I'm just a consumer. I like beer and uh, I have been following the, uh, the saga of the pandemic from the point of view of a journalist who was worrying that she won't be able to write her weekly newsletter except for all the uh, doom mongering that told us in, in the early weeks of, of the pandemic last April that thousands of craft brewers would go out of business pronto. And uh, fortunately, this is the good news, one of the good news that I'd like to start on. Um, it, it didn't happen. So the, the long tail is, is still in business, surviving for all we know, and some actually did quite well. Um, the other good news is that many managed, as Tim already said, to pivot to direct-to-consumer shipping, as it is called in the industry's lingo, um, selling beer directly to their consumers from brewery doors or doing deliveries or what is the third thing? Um, web shops, most importantly. Um, what worries me, and that is the bad news, uh, is that I'm not so much sure that the governments will really clamp down on, on beer or alcohol for that matter, except by perhaps introducing minimum unit prices as the Irish plan to do. But what really worries me is what will happen to to breweries once the various types of government support come to an end. I fear that we will see, at least in Germany, um, quite some bankruptcies as of Christmas this year. And that could really alter the face of the industry because uh, we're quite used to um, morbidity among heritage and legacy brewers, but I don't think that we are used or will be okay with, with the death toll as we fear it will be. What I also worry about is the long-term change to consumers' behavior. Um, the American brewers have made much of at-home drinking occasions when people drink at home and what they do while they drink. Um, I don't see this actually in practice over here. But uh, I do wonder whether the pub experience will be as central to people's experience of beer as it was before COVID. Somehow you've been muted, Gina. So where did you stop hearing me? I was talking about the long-term changes and one is the consumer behavior, especially about amongst youngsters. I do worry that what I call flash mob drinking, that is meeting outdoors in parks, in public spaces and uh, provide your booze courtesy of a rucksack, that this is going to actually persist because uh, of the price difference between on-premise beers and, and uh, cheap supermarket stuff. So these are some of the issues I'm, I'm concerned with. So hopefully you prove me wrong or can contradict me, but uh, as said, okay. uh, that's what I worry about. CCC, that sounds as if it's nudging into your territory. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, hi everybody. I'm, I'm Klaus Christian Carbon, um, shortly known as CCC. So uh, I'm a full professor of uh, psychology and uh, I have a special field of uh, perception and um, also innovation also about experience and also taste experience. So I have close contacts also as a, as a beer sommelier uh, to, to gastronomy and uh, to, to pubs, um, to, to, to smaller breweries and so on. And um, for me, um, it's so important to, to stress that pubs and beer drinking is mostly a, a social thing. And I even say um, uh, very openly that innkeepers, they are very, very important. They are pivotal uh, uh, in them. They're meaningful for people because they have really moderating uh, 
um, uh, abilities. Um, for example, also for radicalism, um, they are a good medicine against. So, so my general fear is that these small glittering uh, wonderful pubs, these beer gardens uh, all around the world and so on, um, that they are really going away and um, that we see a change of drinking behavior and um, more to this pathological home drinking, lonely drinking and, and also um, effect drinking. That's, that's of course um, difficult and it's difficult in two ways. Of course, alcoholism is an issue, but the second thing is also, it is a good reason to ban uh, beer, our beloved beer, um, from, you know, public spaces or from other uh, places, um, also uh, to increase uh, taxes and so on. This I also fear. Um, and with the pandemic, um, there's also one interesting thing for me, because we're also working on so-called authentic marketing and we are, we are um, guiding uh, um, uh, um, uh, all um, these SMEs um, through the pandemic. And um, we see uh, SMEs. So, so small and medium enterprises, okay. sorry. Um, so, so really the, the smaller breweries and so on. And, and we see two kinds of breweries and, and pubs and so on. One, they just wait and they, um, they are now very, very hungry, but they just wait for, for the light at the end of the tunnel. And the second uh, group, um, and, and they are mostly lost, you know, um, and the second one is uh, what you're also talking about, Tim, um, or what you talked about is um, very creative solutions, very responsive uh, behavior. And um, this is very inspiring, I have to say, because we have to develop a more resilient um, SME or culture or brewery culture, pub culture and so on, that is more adaptive to such crisis. There won't be, this won't be the, the only crisis in the future. Of course. No, we have we have climate change coming over the yes, horizon. Yes, for that. example. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions lined up in advance. Um, the first one we've covered part of this already. Um, do any other members of the panel feel they have a clear picture of what's happened to the world of beer in the last fifteen months across Europe, and has there been uh, has it been noticeably better or worse in any particular countries? Um, I think I'm going to you, Simon, at first again. That's okay. Thank, thank you, thank you, Tim. I mean, I, I mentioned this um, this report that we um, we commissioned and published a, a a few a few weeks back, and um, so yes, I mean, we have a, a a pretty good picture. Just perhaps not the last fifteen months, but just comparing twenty twenty with twenty nineteen. And as I mentioned, uh, I mean, we as everyone would expect, I mean, it's the beer sales in the hospitality sector that have really been uh, hit, which are down forty two percent. Um, what's interesting is beer sales in the retail sector were up 8%. Um, so there is a, which um, uh, basically compensated. So about a third of the volumes were sort of were, were picked up in, in retail, but that meant that overall beer sales were down um, uh, 9%. So, so, I mean, there's a, you know, there has been a, certainly not been the, the, the shift to from, from the on trade to the off trade as a, some have uh, tried to present sort of with uh, um, pictures of uh, empty supermarket supermarket shelves. I mean, and in fact, I mean these numbers vary hugely across 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 countries, and um, perhaps we'll, we'll we'll get into what what what, what, is, what, what is impacting uh, that. What we also saw, and this and this is um, actually key to I think uh, the questions around what the threats are about how governments will will be reacting. What we actually want to look at is what has been the impact of that on the wider economy as, as well. And um, what, what the report showed was that um, previously there were around 2.6 million jobs created by beer in, in Europe, most of these being in, um, in the hospitality sector. And what the report estimated was that 860,000 jobs have been lost in beer hospitality as a direct result of the uh, of the lockdowns and the decline in beer sales in, in pubs and, and, and restaurants. Um, what it also showed was that governments have actually lost out on 11 billion euros in tax revenues, because of course there is excise, but there's also VAT uh, on the sales uh, 
that would that would, that would have gone through um, the hospitality sector, but also but also all the the taxes that are usually paid by the employees um, in 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 these venues. And what we've also seen is that 13 billion euros in value added has been taken out of the uh, economy. And what we want governments to recognise is that actually, if they want to get the economy going, if they want to increase their tax revenues again, what they need to do is recognise that getting beer hospitality back up to pre-COVID levels can actually return those jobs, can return the value, can return the tax revenues to the, um, to the economy. So it's actually the tax revenues will be increased by supporting beer, not by increasing beer taxes. And I think if that, if that point can be understood, and it's a tricky one to, uh, the, to get across, then it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a clear, it's a, a, a clear, uh, would be a clear victory. And just in terms of sort of uh, the comparing, you know, how, how different countries have fared, I mean, I'd say there are um, perhaps a, a, couple of, a couple of issues that obviously logically have impacted this. And firstly, it's basically been the extent of how, how hard has COVID hit that country and how hard the restrictions have um, um, have been and the duration of these. And obviously we know that there are still some countries that are still fully locked down, others where their places are open, but still operating at just outside or 50% capacity clo um, enclosures. And obviously the other key factor that impacts the extent to which the brewing industry has been hit is the size of the hospitality sector itself. Um, because uh, what we know is that uh, um, there are countries where the hospitality sector is 10% of the beer market or even less than 10% of the beer market. And then there are countries like Spain, yeah. Portugal, Malta, Greece, uh, Italy, Ireland, where it's 60%, even up to 70% of the, the market. And these are obviously the countries where the impact has been, it's been immense. Um, and as I say, also because unlike perhaps unlike for other products, there hasn't been this switch across from, um, from uh, the pub to, uh, to supermarket uh, purchases. And I think um, it, was, oh. uh, it was just mentioned. I mean, it's because it's the loss of the whole, the beer occasion, the experience, the pub experience, and uh, that can't be recreated by, uh, by simply uh, having a drink at home on your own. Yeah, I, should, I should point out to everyone that um, Simon, uh, his many responsibilities of Brewers of Europe, one of the things he does is produce Beer Trends, which is an annual report on the statistics of beer in different countries across Europe. I'm one of the small number of peop very sad people who actually reads every single word of it every year. Um, but it's fascinating to actually get, a, it's one of the best ways to get a really good grip on where beer is actually sold. Um, and one, one of the things is beer, beer is differentially there's differentially more beer sold in on sales than off sales, and that's uh, the, the, if you've got a if you've got a hospitality outlet, regardless of where you are in Europe, the chances are there'll be a greater percentage of beer sold there than there would be, say, in a supermarket or an off sales outlet. I think I'm right in saying. Um, but the uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm going off script, which I should never do. The um, Ina, um, how? Uh, uh, what you're, if I just remember you what, remind you what the original question was, have you got a clear picture of what's happening across Europe in the last 15 months to uh, beer and brewing? And has it, is, is it worse in, in some countries than others? It's certainly worse in some countries than others. And numerically, that relates to what Simon has just said. I mean, depending on the size of the on-premise in terms of total beer sales, the, the decline was worse than for countries like Germany, where 80% of all beer is consumed at home or in parks, or, and I think I want to mention that as well, at festivals. This is going to be the second year that we will not have a Munich Oktoberfest. And that is just the, the most well-known event. I mean, throughout the year, we have thousands of Schützenfeste, or what we call Dulten, just seasonal festivals where lots of beer is consumed. I mean, these are all traditional things. And because of COVID regulations, they were canceled last year and will be canceled again this year. And they were also important for, for beer culture, although lots of people just went there to get sussled, I must confess. 
but it's part it's part of your upbringing certainly here in in, in bavaria to to go to these stews and i do worry about their their future because i remember when the second gulf war broke out in the early 90s suddenly all the carnival ballroom dancing events were cancelled for moral reasons because it was deemed indecent to be partying while people were dying in the Gulf War. So when the war was over and these carnival parties were allowed to recontinue, everybody said, Phew. they were so dowdy, so boring, you just went because it was the custom yeah. and they stopped happening altogether and no one cried out for them. So I don't think that will be the case if lots of festivals or beer festivals won't happen again or won't take place again. But I, I think yes, the yes. old adage, if you have done some, something twice or not done something twice, you won't miss it. And I think yeah. a lot could depend on, on our newly learned behavior and expectations. Yes, beer consumers or, or in things to recover or not. Beer consumers in the UK actually run something like 150 different beer festivals each year, and uh, I think it, it's a, there's a fear that people are getting out of the almost getting, getting out of the routine of doing it. I know there's an enormous amount of frustration. Mm -hmm. um, CCC, yeah, the, uh, <laughs> you have an interest in how how people drink and drinking behaviour. How have we been behaving during lockdown? You know, one one big issue is really um, after the pandemic, the world will be a different one uh, because people are sensitized, for example, for hygienics. And, um, you know, there's a good reason for it, of course, and, and there are good aspects uh, that people really aim for more hygienics. Um, but that also means um, uh, people in the first phase will feel uncomfortable if not everything is is done properly um, to to accommodate this, you know, and that's also a problem because we are used to have very efficient beer festivals, for example, because they are. Why are they efficient? Because um, there are a lot of people in dense rooms, or you know, it's it's very dense everything, and um, also the the whole. Um, the filling in um, is very, very efficient because it's it's just fast and so on. And but you will change this. You have to change it. And people are now so sensitive to all these things. They they see see everywhere. Um, they have the idea that it's um, that it's making you ill. You know, and yeah. this will also affect um, the small pubs, especially, and also the beer festivals. And um, I think we have to train people uh, also um, to, to comply to these new rules, to have some clever ideas, um, um, but still to not fear, to, to lose the character because, you know, the character is, is the asset. It's a clear, yeah, we, we, we don't want to go in a sterile um, condition there, you know, but um, we want to be safe, of course. Yeah. Okay, um, the, just moving on slightly, and Simon, you sort of alluded to this a bit. Um, has beer been affected by COVID more than other types of alcoholic beverage? Um, it, it, I, 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 was very, I was fascinated by uh, reading some stuff recently that said for the first time in eight or nine years, last year there appeared to be a, an increase in directly alcohol-related deaths. And I'm a great skeptic. I, I am, I'm medically trained. I was a consultant psychiatrist for many years. And I can tell the difference between medical bullshit and medical fact. And what I was expecting to find an awful lot of the former. Uh, but when I looked at it, they were actually talking about 2020 seeing direct um, toxic deaths or Ill illnesses directly related to alcohol. First time of an first time of a significant increase, first time of an increase in eight years, which is fascinating. And it seemed to coincide with a swing away from drinking beer in public places to drinking wine and spirits at home. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I just put that in as a thought. Uh, would any, anyone on the panel like to take that first? Or? I mean, uh, thank you, Tim. I mean, I think on, on that 
point you uh, you make. I mean, I think what we I mean overall alcohol consumption has also has also declined. But what I think, yeah, the what has happened over the past twelve months is probably yeah vulnerable people, people who have problems, who are. Um, what we have seen is more isolation, mental health issues uh, um, evolving. So I think yeah, where people who are have problems with drinking, addicted people, yeah, potentially uh, support groups that that stopped running. I mean, I think that is that is certainly a a, a challenge with, the, with these vulnerable populations, and you've seen uh, other other such sort of social issues that have, that have arisen simply because of the fact that people are are cooped up all day um, and haven't got their sort of their their their, their outlets. I mean, I think comparing sort of how beer has been affected with, compared to other alcoholic beverages. I mean, yes, it's been hit more because of this close tie and sort of mutual dependence with the with the hospitality sector. But if also, if you think about it, and I'm glad we uh, got onto that, I mean, it's it's not just the hospitality sector, but all these beer occasions that have been restricted the most. So it's uh, you know, the whole culture, the socializing itself has become a bad thing. And um, and, 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 and has been banned for weeks and months on end. So it's not just the pubs, bars, and cafes, but it's been, it's been big events, but it's also been village festivals, it's, uh, it's weddings, it's concerts, it's, uh, but even sporting events, but even, I mean, here, here based in, in Belgium, uh, you weren't allowed to have a barbecue. You're not allowed anyone in your, you're not allowed any friends around. All, all these uh, even small private social occasions which are typically beer occasions have been have been taken out of the taken out of the equation, and I'm sure and I know, for example, from the wine industry, they, they saw an increase in bag in box wine sales have gone up, and uh, and if you think about it, that's yeah, there's a certain logic to that. People are now uh, yeah. have changed their habits and they're consuming at consuming at at home. So I mean, I think you know what we've seen is how important to many consumers is not just the beer but actually the beer the beer occasion and people don't want to replace yeah don't want to replace having a beer with their friends uh, in a pub with drinking at home on their own or or or, yeah. or even or even or even it can be yeah people that typically consume consume wine maybe at maybe at maybe at home and beer when they when they go out so yeah, it's, it's Belgium, okay. for example, retail retail sales of beer in Belgium did not go up. In fact, they went they went down for uh, for a lot of time because and, and it was the sales of other alcoholic beverages that went that went up in the in the retail. And that's that's for a, a beer country, but the Belgians don't yeah they don't like to switch uh, going to the the brasserie with uh, with uh, with drinking at home. Mm, yeah. Yes, it's early days, but I'm, I'm I'm fairly hopeful that there is going to be a case to be made that drinking beer in uh, in on on sales is definitely healthier for you than drinking wine at home. I think that's going to be great for the future of brewing, but um, we need a few more bits of data before we can say that. I think I'm um, only got oh, tongue in cheek there. Um, CCC. Yeah, um, we, we tend to to analyze these these data always on a on a very general ground. And as Simon said, there are several groups that are really especially vulnerable. And if you look up the data, it's it's really um, traumatic. If you look at anxious people, and especially I have looked it up the statistics, um, people with economic worries, they are super vulnerable, and they are now really often heavy drinkers. And this makes the whole industries, the hospitality industries, um, susceptible. You know, it's um, because people tend, again, to overgeneralize and say, well, this is a problem. You know, beer is a problem. Well, it's a, it's a functional thing, and we have to solve um, the problems that, that caused the anxiety. You know, uh, we, we have to fight the anxiety, and then the drinking, the heavy drinking will will stop or will decrease. That's the, the issue, but not to um, prohibit uh, any things and so on. So that's always my issue to, to really look very selectively, very, very um, with differentiation on the data and not just on, you know, 9% on average decrease sounds awful. But um, uh, if you look at the increases, the specific ones, then you, you really uh, gain 
very important information. Yeah, it was interesting in the in the UK, the Institute of Alcohol Studies, which is a, a academic institution, but it well, well, people don't realize it's funded by an organization that used to be called the Temperance Movement. Um, it's uh, completely independent, of course. The um, but they came, they've come up with some very interesting data. I think a very very straightforward data, saying that uh, sales of alcohol in the UK in 2020 were actually three or four percent higher than in the previous year. But what is not clear is whether or not they, 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 they've done that by taking government data on how much money has been raised in excise. What they haven't made clear is whether that was including the pretty large stockpile of wine in particular, but also beer uh, that was imported before Brexit on the 1st of January, um, looking to, to save down the line. Um, if they're right, and if, if, if there was an increase in alcohol consumption in 2020, that's quite alarming, actually. Um, the, uh, but yes, hey, the, you know, anything on, um, I know you deal mainly with brewing, so you may not know the data for wines and spirits. Um, what I can say with some certainty is that uh, if brewers moan that their sales have gone down, they have a reason for that because yeah. alcohol producers are on the whole fairly good at massaging figures. And I don't want to be quoted on that, but that is the case. <laughs> You've only got but, 91 people watching you. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if they moan about declining sales, yes, they went down all over. Uh, I know that uh, the anti-alcohol, uh, I don't think I, I'm allowed to call them the anti-alcohol lobby. I think they are socially concerned citizens. Um, they, 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 they like to interpret the data their way to actually no. arrive um, at some alarmist conclusions like, oh my God, people have been drinking more booze, da, 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 da. And therefore we need to increase the excise. We have to reduce opening hours and, and, and the full works that you know best, Tim. So um, yes, I think... Uh, Country by country, the data is, is different. So there have been shifts from beer to other alcoholic beverages. But uh, I think on the whole, everything just went down because people had fewer occasions. And, uh, and it's, it's certainly not fun to, to stay at home and uh, just have yourself for company. But I think for once, we can actually trust the big brewers and their forecasts because... Uh, whether we like them or not, but uh, they're they not stupid. And uh, the reason they are promoting these ridiculous hard seltzers in, in Europe this year is because they believe that at home consumption is going to increase in years to come. People are not going to stop being setisauruses. So, Yes, we may all love to go to, to the pub, but many people who may soon be facing redundancy or reduced hours or, or economic hardship of whatever kind, they will be counting their euros or pounds or whatever currency you are on, and uh, they will need to economize. And uh, going to a pub is becoming really expensive. And, and that is also because, unfortunately, the brewers last year, tried to save their skin and their balance sheets by pumping beer into the off-premise at rock bottom prices. I thought it was just a German habit of down pricing your beer and selling it like washing powder without respect for the product. But I saw it happen all over that promo offers were ubiquitous and permanent. And I think that is also something that bears its own dangers. Yeah, you, for, you, mentioned, hard, to come. you mentioned hard seltzers there. That, that's, I think that's something that means different things in different countries in the sense that hard seltzers have only very recently really been rolled out in the UK um, and hasn't yet attracted as much attention as I think they probably should do. Um, I I call them hipster alco pops because, as far as I can see, they're they're the same principle as an alco pop. In but alco pops, that... Tim, tasted nice. Ah, well, no, they tasted sweet. Yeah, what they've done is they, they've taken the sugar out. They were wonderful, Tim. 
<laughs> they were wonderful, and that's why they were so vicious, and yes. that's why they attracted youngsters. I don't true. think that uh, youngsters will go for hard seltzers the way they went for Alka Pops. Well, it'll be interesting. I think I think hard seltzers are are, are aimed at a slightly older generation. No, um, no, 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 no. Twenty, no. twenty somethings. Are they okay? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll see. I think the as I, for those who haven't come across hard seltzers, they're basically uh, drinks that have got an alcohol content similar to that of beer. Or five percent. Like, it's five percent. Um, they. Uh, they have flavorings in them um, and quite a lot of them are produced within the brewing industry uh -huh. um, I don't know whether all of them are but but, but uh, certainly a high proportion are mm -hmm. um, what has been quite alarming in the US is that uh, craft brewers who've got you know the full beard the, the regulation cap and all the sort of right on views uh, are also being taken up by these things and there, there you're getting craft brewery hard seltzers I assume because the margin to produce them is much higher Mm -hmm. But um, that's that's quite alarming. It, it, it sort of brings me on to one of the questions that, that uh, uh, came up uh, in discussion yesterday. The, before the pandemic, some really interesting things were happening in the world of beer, uh, every, across the whole of Europe, but across the whole of the world, really. And one of them was that different styles of beer, some of which were being revived from 100 years ago, uh, and some of which had really been invented in the last few years, were coming to the fore and there was greater variety, probably a bigger variety of different types of, uh, of classy beer uh, were on the market than had been for a hundred years. Um, what do we think is gonna happen to that after the pandemic is over and, and, and things are settling back to something, a new normal? Do we think that's going to thrive or do you think that's that's going to be suppressed or what? I don't, I don't stick it, CCC. So, so first of all, uh, what most people don't um, think of is people will in the future make a lot of home officing. You know, this changes the whole working uh, world. And this also means that you have now better the chance to drink at home also during the day. So I did it already before, but um, <laughs> but uh, that's another issue. Um, but, uh, you know, um, the, the important thing is if the, um, there will be a lot of home drinking much more than before, and if the, the, the brewing industries with these uh, really the, the nice uh, new beers, the various uh, beers and so on, and have really a good country um, uh, distribution system, then I propose um, then I, I really predict that the consumption of these new jewels, they will increase. It will increase definitely because people have more time. They devote more time on these things. And so the variety will increase, but only if the distribution system is easy to catch because most people don't like to, you know, to pay a lot of money by special distributors or so. So this is essential for me. Yeah. Sorry, I was just distracted there but by a, um, a question from the chat room that is, uh, it's sort of pertinent to this. The, we, it, taking us back to something we were talking about earlier, because um, I, I take your point about the increase of drinking at home and I think the home drinking culture might get very interesting. Um, but Brian B, who um, was ironically was having to move from the pub to somewhere else and having to change. So he, he was offline for a time. I don't know whether he's back. He said, uh, when we were talking about a more resilient pub culture, and I think in this context, I'm thinking a pub culture that can start to bring people back from home drinking to more social drinking uh, in, 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 in public places, uh, by which I mean buildings, not, not parks. Um, what, what do we mean by a resilient pub culture? What would be a good resilient pub culture? A few ideas that might improve pub culture. You, 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 you're all, none of you are on none of you are muted, the panel. Um, so, <laughs> who so wants to pitch in? Maybe I, I, I start first because I also um, uh, took this, this uh, term, uh, resilient pub culture. So first of all, what, what I saw here specifically in, in Bavaria, 
most breweries or pubs, uh, pub breweries uh, had no chance to, to really change their distribution system. That was a problem. You know, they are used to have barrels or kegs or so, but no big bottling. That is a problem. The second thing is um, they don't have the, the area to, to host people outside in such a dimension that they need, you know, um, and there, you know, all the communities, they are really needed to, to give them away for a while, at least um, uh, places, squares, uh, areas where people can be in a, you know, uh, in just gathering together and not coming to the pub. So it's, it's important to have um, adaptive structures and also distribution structures. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's quite a technical thing in terms of um, uh, what, what, a, what a more resilient pub, if you like, would look like. I mean, I'll, I'll fire off from the UK point of view. One of the things that sort of struck me about the, the pub business in the UK over the last 10 years is that increasingly um, it's, it's diverging into two types of pub. There's one that's large and does everything and sells food and has got room for children and they encourage dogs to come and blah, 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 blah. It does absolutely everything. It's, they're often pretty boring. Um, they're no doubt very successful businesses. They employ a lot of people, but, they, but, but for them to stand out from other opportunity to do things in the evening um, is quite difficult. You've then got a, a, a micro pub culture of places that are really quite retro and are, are down to groups of people uh, coming together, no music, little in the way of food. They come together, they drink beer, they have conversation, they sometimes read newspapers. Um, and it, until fairly recently, that was an old man thing. It, nowadays, that's not an old man thing. Certainly, there are there are equivalents of that where it's a young person's culture, but they're they're small and they're a limited offer, but they're about conversation and they're about usually about quite high, uh, interesting beers. Um, I'm just I'm just wondering whether resilient pub culture needs to get away from this idea of large chains of pubs owned by property companies and run by uh, usually quite poorly paid people. Um, to to, uh, to to then grow something that's a bit more bespoke. I'm trying to be provocative. I mean, I just I mean, just the word resilient. I mean, I'm I'm a bit uh, concerned when I sort of hear it in in the sense that we've just gone through 15 months where yeah, where some where it's it's not really been a question of resilience. It's just been some pubs have been in the unfortunate situation that they haven't got an outdoor space, and consequently. They can't serve at the moment. It's for their business model. They they're so small that it doesn't make sense to to, to open as a at a fifty at a fifty percent fifty percent capacity. And I think that's the concern is what what will get lost is actually it, you know there's always some businesses that were that were already close to the edge that probably it's uh, it's accelerated their 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 demise. But there are these uh there are these other businesses that they don't have an outdoor space so that. It was a perfectly good business model they had that has been uh, tested by by this surreal social yeah. experiment of, uh, of 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 shutting everything, or then and then opening up some places, but not but not but not others. And uh, you know, the challenge that uh, and we, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure it's happened in other countries, but uh, in Belgium when they opened the uh, the bars again outside, um, yeah, unsurprisingly, it was raining. Um, and lots of businesses decided not to open, um, especially places that restaurants, for example, where, yeah, as if if, a place, if it suddenly started to rain, what do you do with the customers who are sat out who are sat outside? You can't, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you they can't rush inside. You you probably want these people to settle their bills. I mean, it it, it didn't make sense, and so I think uh, you know, the resilience at the moment is a, it's a slightly uh, um, yeah. strange concept, and um, no, I think. It's also interesting to look at sort of the different types of breweries, how they've been affected. And, you know, the ones that have been able to um, have done better are the ones who already had access to retail channels. Um, the ones who were, yeah, and, and, and then there were the ones who were able to adapt a bit, a bit, a bit quicker, a bit quicker than others. But, you know, what we've seen is that, yeah, every, everyone has been, has been hit, but some have been able to at least mitigate for some of the, uh, for some of the, the losses simply by 
nature of that was their business model. And uh, yeah. you know, maybe it's a matter now of companies having to diversify in case of uh, global pandemics. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bizarre thing to have to factor into your, yeah. your business model that you might be suddenly shut from one day to the next. I, th I think it, it's 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 interesting to compare how pubs work in the UK with how pubs work in Belgium, um, and I'm probably going to generalise here and upset the Belgians in the audience. But my I, my understanding was that there is um it was well my experience was that there's uh, a pub is only a pub for a certain length of time in Belgium, or uh, very often there is the the license or whatever is renewed every seven years or so, and so there is an extent to which bars in Belgium are. Um, or cafes in Belgium are, are akin to restaurants more generally around the world, which is that they're constantly reinventing themselves. Um, and we don't see that in some countries, in England and I, in, in the UK and Ireland. The pubs are in the same place in the same buildings, often with the same name for decades, if not centuries. And there is not this tradition of new businesses generating uh, frequently all over the place, uh, which there are in other countries. Um, I wonder whether we, we, in a sense, we need to move towards that model a lot more because it's the genesis of new new pubs in uh, UK and Ireland in particular, um, and I, I suspect elsewhere that might might be more of the future if we're going to get this sort of resilience in the future. I take your point about the last fifteen months. And yeah, I started talking. Tim, we've had a, a few questions, so I'll just read out just a few at random. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll just pose a few of them and then I'll suggest if you want to pick up them, pick them up as you, as you wish. Um, so one of the questions or comments came up 100 years ago, we had the uh, uh, World War I uh, Spanish flu, and then that was followed by the Roaring Twenties. So I guess the question's asking after this period of, uh, of depression, is it likely that we're going to have a, a major uplift? And I guess and the subsequent question is, what will that look like? Um, you've already mentioned the one about the resilient pub culture. Um, could the expected change of beer consumers' behaviour happen to be more in favour of craft beer compared with mainstream beer? Um, Do you want to take the? So we take the first one of those. Yeah, feel free, because I think there's probably so many. You, you yeah, lose them I think so those great. are both those are both interesting questions. The the are we going to have a roar, the equivalent of the Roaring Twenties? I, I as as a doing my Eeyore bit of, of, of bearing in mind the changes that might happen with climate change. <laughs> How do we think things are going to go? CCC. So there's one really essential difference to, to the situation to, uh, 100 years ago. Of course, there was also a pandemic and a crisis before war, and we had an economic crisis before and, and so on. You can, you can see a, a lot of perils, but people are mostly now concerned about one thing. That is not the pandemic. It is really climate change, the future of the planet. And this changes the whole, you know, there are now questions about artisanal uh, beer, about uh, organic things and so on, and the craft beer, individualism, um, uh, and, and so on. It, it changes and it has really changed our whole culture. And I think this will um, be the, the trend for the next 15, 20 years. So um, after the pandemic, um, this will continue. Yeah. And um, this trend to, to craft beer will, will increase. I'm, I'm pretty sure if it's not totally going crazy in uh, terms of uh, being expensive or so. Just to, just to cut across people, um, I need to uh, disappear somewhere for a couple of minutes just to deal with something. Um, if you can keep this conversation going, I should be back with you in about two and a half minutes. So can I say something, please? Yeah, go ahead. Question. Um, I would generalize that our attitude to life in this decade is far less full of abandon as it was in the 1920s, according to the literature that we can read for testimonies. So we have been told to be far more politically correct, far more morally sober and uh, refined that uh, 
all of this would stand in the way of a rerun of, of the Roaring Twenties. And uh, I think we also have far more concerns on our plate than uh, our forefathers or foremothers had a hundred years ago. Um, I, I think what uh, Tim said, uh, biodiversity and how that was affected by the pandemic. Um, I don't think there's nothing to worry about. Biodiversity is here to stay. And thanks to all the, the movements towards direct to consumer shipping, we will still be able to get the bears we want. I don't think that we now have to rely on the supermarkets to provide the choice. They won't because they will use the pandemic to actually do some shelf clearing and just uh, provide the space for the big brewers bulging portfolios. So that's their game. Um, consumers, if you're internet savvy, you can find the beers, but it takes more of an effort. You also have to start reading beer blogs and find out what there is. So it takes more time and an effort to, to drink differently and flavorfully each evening, but it can be done. And I think uh, quite easily nowadays too. So whether that actually translates into increased business for craft breweries, I don't know. Perhaps they will do better once they are allowed to reopen the tab rooms. But apart from that, for the consumer, I don't think there is much to worry about. But it's just what I want to emphasize. You won't find the beers in the supermarkets. And most likely, you won't find them in the on-premise either. I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, I mean, that was the one one point I I I, I, want, I wanted to make today is is what one thing that's been it was going to happen anyway, but it's been massively accelerated is this increase in on in online sales in um e-commerce e e web, web shops, which means that yeah, I mean, if you go to a supermarket, it's often not a very large selection uh, as well. So it is suddenly it is people who usually wouldn't do online shopping are now doing online shopping and and it suddenly and uh, and, and Tim mentioned it as well I think the the adaptability of some of these smaller businesses the willingness to work together which I thought was very interesting in terms of uh, teaming teaming up has meant that there are suddenly people discovering who yeah, perhaps would which try the different beers available in their supermarket during their weekly shop have suddenly discovered that there are that you can actually pretty easily get access to a to a to a wider variety and just try something different and then obviously you try something different and some things you'll like some things you won't but uh, I think that has uh, certainly been accelerated and um, I was also interested in what you said at the beginning Ina about the uh, uh, the fact that you didn't think many breweries would have actually closed, although it may be that that, that may be something that hits them at the end of this this yeah. year. I mean, I would I would closely link the, the the diversity of beers that are out there to the numbers of breweries that are that are out there as well. And the, I mean, the last five years, um, um, if I can refer back to the our publication that Tim was very happily plugging earlier. <laughs> Um, it was showed that basically a, a thousand breweries were opening in in Europe every every year on, on on aggregates, and obviously that leads to diversity because all of these breweries um, were had multiple brands, multiple multiple beer styles, and, uh, and I think that is you know that is certainly uh, the color that has been brought into the into the into the beer industry over the over the last ten years, and uh, and as also um, um encouraged uh, the larger the larger brewing companies to up their game as well i mean there's there's a reason that they get into this uh, get into that side of the business as well because they see that uh, that's what consumers are interested in mm -hmm. yes it was very interesting i, I was um <clears throat> until about six weeks ago i've been living in bristol for six weeks uh, for, sorry, for six years and um it has a very lively small brewery scene got about the best part of 20 small breweries and watching their response to the pandemic I was just concerned that they they would have a chance of surviving so I was just promoting the fact that some of them were delivering locally but I then started following what they were actually doing as a business model and up up to about you know a couple of weeks ago 15 of them would deliver anywhere on the UK mainland 
simply because they were using the courier services. Now, this would have been unthinkable um, 15 months ago. I'm sure if COVID hadn't happened, most Bristol breweries would be delivering most of their beer within the Bristol area, and mm -hmm. a few would be joining national circuits for distribution. So it's, that's been great. I, I, I do wonder, trying to link this with the uh, response to climate change, I do wonder whether there's going to be more and more uh, emphasis on pubs in particular uh, and supermarkets being encouraged to differentially supply beers that are made within 15 kilometers or whatever, 20 kilometers of uh, where the outlet is. I think that's quite an attractive thing to look at in terms of keep, keeping carbon footprint down. And where you've got beers that are broadly similar, or broadly similar styles, um, why get one from 300 miles away, if you, or 300 kilometers away, if you can get one from 10 kilometers away? Uh, answer, well, if it's really a good one, then fine, but... Um, Tim, I object. I'm all foot boys that if it's on the top of my head to have that new Belgian beer, I mm. want it. Mind you, I can't get it because I'm stuck in Germany where these beers are mostly unavailable. Well, you haven't, you haven't Brexited. Um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, the, I, I, yes, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I must admit, this is just an idea I've been formulating for a time. The, it strikes me that beers that are much of a muchness, um, and then they may even be, you know, good, you know, cast scale is a very good example in the UK. There are a lot of good producers of local car scales. Um, there aren't that many that are producing stonkingly good car scales that are so far ahead of the rest that they should be available everywhere. Um, if you go to bottle beers, then um, I, well, I have two good examples in front of me. I'm, do, I'm, I'm, I'm using the appallingly bad taste camera didn't happen beer Great British Beer Festival glass, which is covered in coronaviruses, subject to dreadful um, castigation in the national press. And of course, they led to them send, selling every single one. Um, I have a good beer here. It's, it's Jaipur from Thorn, Thornbridge. I haven't been paid to promote this. And it's not my intention. It just happens to be one of the ones I keep in my house because it's jolly good. It's not local, but it's so good that I don't feel guilty about bringing it to you. Well. <laughs> and another example, just randomly, only because this is about the last beer I've got from Belgium. Uh, Duchesse de Bourgogne, perfectly really good um, oak aged brown ale. Um, I would love to be able to continue to drink that in Devon and I wouldn't feel in the least bit uh, compromising of my um, uh, impact on the planet because it's so good that it should be internationally exported. I wouldn't, I don't think the same way about beers that are actually the same as 500 other ones. I, I think there is a case to say those can be produced more and more locally. CCC, you've got your hand up. Exactly. This is this is the point. You know, um, the standard beer um, should be and will be more from the region. And um, of course, nobody should uh, prohibit to, to let us um, order a beer from, you know, somewhere because we, we just love to have this specific beer. But this is a very con conscious uh, consumption and not just you know not just the Heineken that is the standard although it's 1,000 kilometers away produced um, that will won't be the standard model I predict um, so um, but you know great to have good beers uh, in a conscious way from all over the world of course but this is then an an extra and not the standard. Hmm. I mean, we talked we talked about uh, different um, different alcoholic drinks. I mean, I think that is if you didn't we sort of talking about between different breweries and between different beers. Compare the beer industry with the wine industry and the spirits industry. It's a very it's a very different model. And I think um, yeah, as sustainability becomes more important, I think there are opportunities for brewers, the brewing sector as a whole, to communicate more about this this, this loc localness which i think is actually is is it is important but but not just um sustainability that comes from the, the localness but all, all the other um actions that are uh, that the breweries are taking to 
cut down their environmental footprint, whether that be uh, where they're getting their energy from, um, where how they're how they're treating their water, uh, how they're using their secondary their, their secondary materials. I think there are, we will certainly see increasingly brewers and indeed companies in general and brands in general competing on sustainability, and it will it will move up the uh, up the uh, hierarchy of of consumers. As Ina says rightly, not at not at the expense of good taste and good quality. And I think it's. I mean, it's the same. People people like to try something uh something local. At least try it once. Mm -hmm. But again, if 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 the product is rubbish, they're not going to carry on. They're not going to carry on consuming it. And I think there will always be that niche for the the unique the unique product. Um, and uh, and I think that will also push continue to push the uh, the innovation that's been going on in the. Uh, in the in, in the brewing sector of new styles but also as you mentioned of uh, re reinventing um uh, very uh, very old styles and uh, tradition traditional beers it was just picking up on that point the, one of the things um i was i was quite conscious of uh over the last couple of years before the pandemic was there seemed to me to be um a, a, a two-headed issue arising Beer was starting to become sexy because there was much more interest in small breweries. There was much more interest in uh, new and old beer styles that have been revived. There was there was there started to be a sort of connoisseur market of good beer. Um, and meanwhile, at the same time, the 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 what I call industrial beers, which I know is not a very popular way of looking at it for some people, um, but the, or the supermarket beers, the the the, the big brands were tending to drift away in terms of their sales. And there was quite a lot of potential in the sense that the larger brewers had quite a lot of control over the market and very, very, very good access to the market. Smaller brewers, mainly a lot of difficulties, but in a funny sort of way, they needed each other and they were starting to work together in collaborative ways. Um, I do, I just wonder whether COVID has, Gonna, what, what impact that will have on COVID. In particular, I just, I fear that large companies might come out of this by just uh, buying up and attempting to use the brands of uh, smaller companies, um, creating a market that they've, done, they've tried before. They, they produce beers with the right names and they can't do it properly because their cost accountants, they get the cost down. Um, I, I, you can vaguely see where I'm going with this question. I'm trying to formulate it into a question, but, but uh, how are large brewers going to behave as they come out of COVID, particularly in regard to the craft market, I think is probably what I'm asking. Shall I offer an opinion? You can offer an opinion, yes. Okay. Um, I'd say for the past 20 years, it was craft brewers and craft beers that carried the beer conversation. Yeah. Um, despite the marketing and the advertising that came out from the big brewers, they didn't have anything meaningful to add to the conversation because they couldn't talk about flavors and they couldn't certainly provide the personal stories like how I started out as a home brewer in my shed and how I upgraded to eventually build this brewery and, and now, here's the best beer I can offer to you and you better love it. That sort of narrative, the big brewers could not offer, but the little guys could. And suddenly while we consumed beer, we had something to talk about, namely the product and the brewers. Uh, the big brewers will come out of the pandemic and they're already doing so by moving beyond beer. That is for pure financial reasons because they know, and this is what the forecasters have told them that, uh, the share of fruit that is currently enjoyed by beer is going to shrink. So it is kind of a lost labor of love to throw more money at, at standard or Pilsner style beer brands. So they will move into these novel uh, segments, what, what are called uh, alternative adult beverages, which include all the various mixes and, uh, and, and and these damned hard seltzers, as I say. So, because they want to be in that sector and that segment is going to boom. 
at least according to the forecasters. And uh, it's never good if you're a stock market listed company to quarrel with the analysts who have been breakfast on the statistics and forecasts. So this is what they are going to do, which means that it's the craft brewers that will continue with the beer conversation on their own. Which I would, is not yes, a bad I mean, thing because this, this is what they have been doing for the past 20 years. Yes, I, I, I always used to, people would, were forever saying to me, because I, I think everybody knows I'm pretty pro independent brewery, um, but people would say, well, you shouldn't be, we should be fair to everybody, and if a large brewer produces a, a really good beer, we should be. Uh, very complimentary about it. And I would say, yes, I agree in principle, it's never happened in practice. Um, the, but the, it's got quite interesting. I, I, I'm really not being paid to promote any of these beers. Pilsner Urquell is a really interesting beer. And I am pretty certain that in the last three to four years in particular, it's become a really top rate Bohemian Pilsner. Um, it's, it's developed a character that is reproducible, it's produced in vast quantities, and it's really excellent, and it's owned by Asahi. So it's, it's the first example I can think of, of a really top-rate beer being produced in vast quantities by a large um, brewery, uh, or global brewer, really. And in a sense, I want to encourage that. I would love to see a Budweiser premium that is actually of some sort of classical American lager that's just better than everything else. I don't think it's going to happen, but it, I'd love to see that. And But my feeling is it's not going to happen because the financial models for very large breweries are not compatible with the attention to detail that is required for a really excellent mm -hmm. beer. Or the attention that you have to give to a portfolio. Yes. And this whole issue of brand, brand is not just a name, it's mm. an image and whatever. And the, uh, it's not quite like that. Pilsen Urquell is not a brand name. It is a specific beer. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can do great things with that. But you don't, you're not obliged to do it to all the other beers produced by that company across the world because it's that one name. Um, but it's been, it's, it's been very disappointing to me over the years, the number of, the number of really, but Sierra Nevada is a good example of a very, very good beer that's produced in vast quantities, it can be done, but they, as I think a lot of people know, they're, they're a company that where the attention to detail has cost them billions over the years, um, they, just, they just happen to like, like making a large production very good beer. We don't see it, we don't see more of those coming over the horizon, CCC. Yeah. Um, but but Ina's point was also a very, very important one about the narratives. You know, um, we are fed up with these standard narratives uh, made by, by standard marketing agencies, very big marketing agencies, telling us that's the best beer and so on. With Pilsner Urquell, you know, it's also a special story. It was the first one of its kind in 1842. Uh, so, so that is a story, you know, uh, and it has a wonderful design that has not changed so much and so on. So you, you feel authenticity, although maybe it's not so authentic anymore. But with the other brands, it's now really becoming a little bit, bit a problem because they tell a story that, you know, all the insurance companies tell you and so on. They are always for you and it's the beer for you, but it's not. It's not the beer for you. And, and so I think I really trust in the future of the smaller breweries because they can build up identity. I see it here around um, people, you know, young students from all over the world, they identify with the breweries here mm -hmm. um, at the place. They say, um, you know, they start uh, uh, here uh, a career and they import their beer and they say, well, that's much better. And then after a while, they say, well, this is really the best feeling. It's the local beer. We love it. But it's also a good beer, I have to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as, as Simon said, uh, if, if, if you don't like it, it doesn't make sense, of course. Yeah. If, if I can just come in, I mean, you you won't find me me talking about big versus small or old, old versus old versus uh, no, 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 versus no. new, but uh, totally unfair. Yeah, and uh, but but um, I mean, but I do like to talk about beer versus wine, um, and and I and uh, and I think that's that's where 
want to see that the, the diversity helped because it brings, I think it's a, it, it certainly opened people's eyes to the beer category as, as a whole. Whereas in the past, if you, if there was only one style of beer that was a, that was out there or that you could easily access, then it was very easy to say, I don't like beer. And I think now there is um, uh, both that diversity out there, but also this sort of this movement to try something local, try something new, test something out. And uh, I think that is where all brewers see that if someone, if someone is suddenly open to drinking beer again, then there are, then there are opportunities for, for everyone. And I think this whole sort of concept of uh, if, if the, uh, let's have the, the cake as big as, as, as big as you can get it. And then, and then, and then see, and then, and then the, the companies fight out about how you, how you divide that cake. I think that is a, you know, that is the sort of the, that's the thinking that that in that means that uh, associations like the Brewers of Europe exist and, and that national associations exist because there are companies that, that see there are advantages to uh, to working together even though they will be competing uh, like hell on on the market and uh, I mean I always tell people that uh, yeah I mean the large yeah. companies they're fighting against each other they're not they're not teamed up there you know, companies don't don't tend to team up to fight other. To fight, to fight others so I but I think the you know what's okay. most interesting is this is this shift that into understanding you know is the number of beer consumers actually increasing and that, and I think that you know that's 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 an interesting uh trend that uh uh will, will be interesting to see as, as as we move forward and I think on sustainability that might be an area where brewers are able to position themselves on the I really talked about it on alcohol and health, the, the, the relatively lower alcohol content of beer, of beer when compared to uh, other drinks. I think all of these are opportunities for uh, to be optimistic about the future for, for beer, even within a situation where people are more health concerned and where there are more, and I, I will use the term anti-alcohol people out there. Yeah. I had a okay. comment, Tim, from a, a certain El Presidente, a, a founding chairman of EBC. Yeah. Um, you may or may not know him, everyone. But his question, it, it, his comment really is, um, with the move to sort of more interesting brewers and, and other um, gin producers, um, distillers, etc., will is an opportunity for them to work together. Will they, by their very nature, start working together um, to basically share each other's products and, and turn, so I guess, small sort of businesses into, into ones that can be sort of more influential by doing that. And just to remind you, Tim, we've got about eight minutes uh, uh, until uh, we, we, the, the session's due to finish. Yeah. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was, I was going to ask Simon an unclear question. Um, can, can, can you see large breweries reopening small breweries locally? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have shot that one at you. Um, <laughs> You'll ask them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Fair enough. Um, yeah. I, I, my, it's it's fairly well known. I, I, one of my things is I think I think working working models between very large breweries that have got excellent distribution, excellent access to market, etc., and small breweries that have got the inventiveness, the creativity, and the the absolute dedication to product rather than necessarily bottom line. Um, I think that's got huge potential, but it does need an awful lot of shifting on both sides of that equation for that to happen. Um, but I think that would be jolly good for beer overall. And I do agree with what you said, Simon, entirely about the beer versus the rest of alcoholic beverage. Yeah, I think we've got some interesting times coming and up. Beer, and beer versus hard seltzer, potentially, as well. As yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there might be some conflict of interest there. That's the only problem. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, we've got about uh, five minutes to go. Uh, Brett, have you spotted anything on the question board that we haven't covered? Um, let me just check. I think you've covered most of it. Um, there's been a lot of interest about salts of beers, there's a lot of comments made about it. Um, and I think a lot of people said they thought it was an issue in their own country. They didn't realise it was uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, yeah, I noticed that Tom Carroll from the US, who's joined us again, was 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 quite surprised it was an issue outside the US. It is it is quite a big issue in the US, I think. It's I, I mean I have to say on hard seltzers, I think it's one of the most cynical, nasty, 
um, trends in 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 the in the alcohol trade that there is. I think it's also counterproductive because. Although I don't have an awful lot of time for what I call the neo-prohibitionists, I think they, they twist data, uh, medical data in particular, to a completely indefensible extent, and it needs to be outed. Um, nonetheless, there, nobody's sort of standing up for everybody drinking more and getting health problems. Um, hard seltzer seems to me to be an invitation to drink too much for people who as yet don't understand that they shouldn't be. Um, quite a few comments about localism as well, Tim. Um, that that's come up quite a number uh, a number of times. People asking if there's an opportunity for uh, smaller businesses to actually be a bit more sort of um, uh, able to do things in a, in in a more env uh, environmentally sustainable sustainable way. And one suggestion was the use of brewery waste for direct heating. There are. I do find. I think the. Um, impact on climate change, impact on the environment is one of the big issues that's going to come in the next couple of years uh, in the brewing trade. You've already seen Carlsberg, in particular, <laughs> Heineken, uh, others launching some really quite coherent and large projects to uh, reduce impact on the environment. It's a challenge for small breweries, but then they do have, what they do have going for them is local distribution with short supply runs um, and they also have um, reduced spend on sort of marketing equipment and all that sort of stuff. And it's marketing, marketing, the whole, all the whole shebang around marketing they don't do, which also saves environmental packaging is the word I'm looking for. Um, any other comments from the panel or just on that general issue of the environmental? I mean, I know it's a huge thing and it's very difficult to cover in the last three minutes, but. Um, I mean, Tim, perhaps, perhaps I, I can make a pretty shameless uh, plug uh, for, for and I mean, we, we have a, our annual event, the Brewers Forum, which is usually usually a, a, an in-person event, but the, we've had to go uh, online. That's running from the 1st to the, to the 4th of June. And I know there's a session on hard seltzer on the, on, on the first day. The fourth day is, is completely devoted to a secondary, to um, sustainability. And there's actually a section around sort of, Secondary secondary materials. What uh, what brewers are doing in terms of some of the include smaller brewers and larger brewers in terms of the, their creativity and uh, and getting down their their footprint. So uh, so it's it, it's a shame shameless plug. But uh, but as it happens, it's uh, it's accessible to everyone this year. Whereas not, not normally it's uh, it's uh, being a physical event. It's only for people that are really in the business. Yeah, I'm 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 perfectly happy for that shameless plug to go ahead. I would just agree that Brewers of Europe Forum is one of the great beer events of Europe, um, and the fact that it's successful this year is is your take. If you've got a real interest in beer, attempt to be there. And and I will also plug uh, for those those beer consumers because I think most of your active consumers in the audience, uh, the Brewers of Europe Beer Statistics Annual is absolutely compulsory. Uh, viewing as is the Bath Haas Hops review. Um, also, Ina, I will just say that Brauvelt International, which is now available in the English language, is the beer magazine that anybody who's a serious beer consumer who wants to get is the one you've got to read, and in particular, Ina's column. Um, in fact, you write, you write about half of it nowadays, don't you? <laughs> I write the news, so so you read me <laughs> every week online okay. so if you want to. Okay. CCC, I don't think you actually have a commercial product uh, on the market. No, it's no okay, not at all. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I only have the World Atlas of Beer, uh, which is an <laughs> unparalleled uh, uh, encyclopedic book that can tell you how the whole of the world of beer is doing. Um, I'm glad we've, we've already gone to the commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think, I think that's the time to wind up. I definitely think that's the time to wind up. Uh, thank you very much indeed, my fellow panel members. Uh, I was delighted to have all of you on the panel. It's gone, I think, pretty well. I hope, I judge from the fact that very few members of the audience have actually signed off, in fact, I don't think anybody has, that we must have been keeping people entertained. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. EBCU is the European Beer Consumers Union. It is the umbrella group for all the consumers groups around Europe. Uh, and we wish it long life and health. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Cheers, people. And that's it. Thank Cheers. You. Cheers. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.
If right. you complete the evaluation, be much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs>